Stacia D. And it's Jay Stan. And welcome back to the In Retrospect podcast, where we look beyond the surface to find understanding. Bring you laughs, knowledge, and culture. So today I wanted to introduce you guys to a very special guest, uh, Mr. Jerron Brown from Jackson, Mississippi. He is a licensed clinical social worker who works for the Department of Veteran Affairs. Um, and he's also a part of Alpha Phi Alpha. Shout out to Justin. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we felt like he would bring some substance to a conversation around the Black community and mental health. Um, we just, well, we're still kind of in the holiday-esque season, kind of finishing it out. We still have a few left, major ones left, but around that time, people tend to, if they're separated from their families, if they don't have a lot of family, if, you know, just a lot of changes are happening in life, that can be really tough on people mentally. Um, but it tends to be a conversation that, although it's becoming less taboo, it's still stigmatized. So I felt like, or we felt like it would be appropriate to talk about it. So why do you think we are afraid to seek help? We being specifically us Black people. All right. So I see you jumping right on in there. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, fast. fast. <laughs> All right, so why are we afraid to seek help as basically as an African-American community? I think there are a lot of different reasons why we are afraid to seek help but I'm gonna give just a couple of them, a few of them. But the first reason I believe is due to the thought process of many of our elders. It's gonna be our grandmothers, grandfathers, or you know, their people before them, our ancestors. You know, in the African-American community, research has shown that many of our elderly population, they didn't grow up believing in the notion of mental health. You know, it just simply didn't exist. That wasn't the way they were raised. And so I've heard plenty of, uh, Older individuals say that in the past, you know, they've called their loved ones crazy or, you know, all the words that people use instead of the politically correct words when it comes to mental health. Mm -hmm. And so I've heard clients say in the past that why would I actually go and seek help for mental health related services when my own family doesn't support me? You know, it kind of makes me seem as if if my family doesn't support me, no one's gonna support me. So I'm not gonna go and seek mental health related treatment. Now, another reason why I believe we don't, as an African-American society, seek treatment is due to something. And I feel like we've come a long way with this one, but we still have a long ways to go. Yeah. It's the African-American community and the church and religion. So, you know, in the African-American community, church is extremely important. We like to go to church. I'm here in the South, so I'm in Mississippi. So this is the Bible Belt. So we go to church every Sunday, um, Wednesday as well. And sometimes, <laughs> sometimes we go yeah, to church it's seven. It's seven hey, every day of the week. all the time. <laughs> sometimes when you go to church, you know, you be in church four, five, six hours, man. But one thing that I've noticed, especially growing up, growing up, when you're raised in the church, if mental health actually exists, we don't talk about those things. Or your family love to use the, the statements such as, especially older people, we'll take you to church and let the pastor pray this out of what mental health is the devil. You know, and that's just not the case. Everything can be cured by the pastor actually praying it out when you go into church and, and trying to get something taken care of. Remember the old saying, and it's in the Bible, faith without work is dead. So you can have all the faith in the world that your mental health related issues can be cured through God. But you also have to put forth the effort too. You have to put the work in as well. And I believe the work comes when you actually go seek treatment or you go actually talk to a therapist or you go do some research on your particular mental health related issue. That's the faith without works is dead statement to me. And so I feel like we've come a long way because we talk about it in my church now, we talk about mental health a lot, but there were a time when we didn't talk about mental health. We just wanted to pray it out. So I think that's another reason why we don't seek treatment because we're looking at the religious factor. Yeah. Another reason is because of, and this is something that we deal with, I know especially African-American women, they deal with it a lot, is the racial biases and the inequality in the healthcare <laughs> system. 
you know, I've done a lot of research and I've read online and heard people talking, especially African-American women that are pregnant. Just look at the hands of how many of our African-American women are dying at the hands of doctors due to them not being being able to receive the services that they need. Yeah, not listening. <laughs> Terrible, man. So if you think about it like that, we are discriminated against a lot of times, not just in the healthcare field, but in the mental health field too. You know, yeah. if a person's having a mental health related issue, especially if it's a bigger person, they don't know how to handle these people. And so, you know, the first thing that they want to do is they want to restrain services from us, but we don't get the same services as the other people get. And so why would I go and seek help for my mental health at a mental health facility or a hospital if I don't believe I'm going to get the same services or the same treatment as the other people do? And so that's another reason why we don't seek those services. And of course, you know, there's other reasons such as not having insurance or yeah. not knowing how to <laughs> seek the services. But these are just a few. As a black male, the perspective I can give is that you're taught at a young age that, oh, you got to be tough. You can't show no emotion. This world is not going to, you know, be as nice to you as it may be to somebody else. As soon as you start whining, the first thing is told totally you suck it up. You'll get over it. You'll be fine. And then all of a sudden, uh, a, black, a black boy will grow into a black man who can't express themselves, can't tell you what's wrong because they've been told to numb and suppress everything that, you know, that they're supposed to be expressing. Now, all of a sudden, everybody's trying to figure out how a grown man is terrible with expressing how he feels. And then from there, that just, you know, it's like a domino effect. Now, all of a sudden, it's like, I need help, but I don't want to talk about it. Exactly. <laughs> and yeah. then you also got, um, Go ahead. I think, uh, oh, yeah, I'm finished it real quick. Yeah. So, and then you also, once you hear that, he goes in, it goes like hand in hand, like what was said earlier by Jerome, when he was talking about like the older folks, when you talk to some of the older folks, the first thing you hear is like back in my day, I used to do this, that, and the third, and I used to say nothing. I used to take it. So since I took it, you got to take it. <laughs> it's just crazy. Um, I think that speaks to two things, toxic masculinity, <laughs> but also uh, resiliency. I think Black people have been conditioned that we are resilient people, which we are, but, and we are strong, but at the same time, like, there are moments we don't need to be strong. There are moments where you need to feel your feelings. You need to recognize that there are certain things that weigh you down that are causing you to not be able to function at 100%. <clears throat> And that's, I mean, that's just what it is. But also you said, I guess you touched on access too, because you said some people don't have insurance. Also, if you live in a rural area, like if you're in the South and you live in a rural area, nine times out of 10, the closest mental health clinic or place is not going to be, yes. it might be at like 45 an hour away. So there's that, um, the cost, because if you don't have insurance, it is costly. It is. Um, unless you're doing something like, a, I know they have like better help now and talk space, but even those, it's it's going to cost money. Oh, you like got to pay a fee. Like, yeah. They want you to pay uh, a fee. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then also the being uh, culturally competent. That is something that is a part of your ethics as a therapist, as a social worker. Nine times out of 10, though, it like, that's hard to be competent in someone else's culture. Like you first have to be aware. And I think that that might be difficult for certain therapists who are not black or- of Yeah, color. yeah. <laughs> I, I completely agree with that. Cause I tell oh. people that all the time, when somebody tries to give the perspective on a different, you know, ethnicity or race, my whole thing is if you're not living it, you wouldn't understand. I understand. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so you, you telling me, yeah, you know, I can relate. No, you can't. <laughs> no, you can't. You can, you can listen. You might be able to suggest certain things, but you're not living it. It's a whole different monster. <laughs> I mean, that turns people off too, though, because yeah. if you if you expect me to come to you, first of all, I'm already resistant to come to you. So I'm, I'm going to decide I'm going to go and go get help. You know, I've talked to my family about it. I've talked to my friends about it. And I think I need to go get help. So I, I finally got through step number one acknowledging that I need the help and I'm going to go. Then I go get it. And when I get to the place, I don't see nobody look like me. And so yeah. I don't want to sit down and tell, tell Tommy what's going on with me when <laughs> he has been through the same lifestyle that I have, or you know, he doesn't know what I'm going through. Because if you don't know what I'm going through, why would I share my struggle with you? Yeah. Do you find that the veterans that you come across or you serve 
uh, do you think that that brings down their wall just a tad because they're they're seeing someone that looks like them? Well, in a sense, see, the veteran population is an extremely interesting population. They are. <laughs> they are veterans. And so yeah. I've never been a veteran. So, you know, when I first started at the VA working for the Department of Veteran Affairs, I, I used to think like, okay, with me not being a veteran, would I be able to kind of get through them? Then with me also being a lot younger than them, you know, yeah. a lot of the veterans I work with are 40, 50 years older than me. And so, you know, I always thought about like, okay, they're like 40, 50 years older than me. Would they actually listen to somebody young as me? But what I found to realize is that they actually do. Um, and I think the thing is that they actually can see themselves in me a little bit. Mm-hmm. Although I'm, I wasn't a veteran, I'm still a black man, a young black guy. And so a lot of things that they see in me is because I'm working with veterans with substance abuse issues. They think back to the time where, hey, you know, if maybe I wasn't using substances or things like this, I possibly could have been doing this. So you're not using these substances. Or you're not doing these things. You're actually doing good as a young black male. And so I'm proud of you. And so, of course, I want to continue to work with you. I want to continue to allow you to be my ther- therapist because I'm proud of what you're accomplishing. I'm proud of what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would agree with that, too. I think, um, you know, the main thing is just that you have somebody that will listen. Because, you know, a lot of times somebody will be talking, but they're not really hearing you. And even with, like you said, once you take that first step, you get there and now you're telling them what's going on. Now all of a sudden you can tell if somebody's actually engaged to what you're saying versus when you're talking and every time you say something, somebody writing, writing down, you sitting there like, hold up now. <laughs> That's There's a lot annoying. of movement going on. Some people, while I'm some people do it like that though. I mean, I, some I, do- I, I do, I, I, I'm not saying that's wrong. <laughs> I'm just telling you with certain people that is a yeah. turn off because now it's like, listen, why, why are you moving? So much while I'm telling you what's going on. I was going to say, um, I have worked with veterans, but working with kids is much different. And especially teenagers, I feel like they have appreciated having me as their therapist. Um, I've had kids actually come into my office and do a deep sigh and say, oh, you're Black. Like, I'm, I'm glad. I, that's what I wanted. I didn't think I would get that. Um, which, to be honest, I think some of them stuck with therapy because they had a Black therapist in my opinion, but go ahead, Justin. Well, I, I mean, the piggyback of what you just said, I have worked with kids too. I'm not licensed or anything, but I do notice there's a theme when it comes to talking with kids, um, especially kids of color. Uh, you do have a lot of people that are in these systems that talk down to them. In a sense, it's like, you need to do this, you need to do that. And it's like, a lot of people don't come down to their level. It's as simple as you could be sitting down in the same chair, at the same level, eye level with them, having a conversation. And they would feel extremely more comfortable talking to you about what's going on. You have so many times now where you have somebody be like, well, you're not doing this right. You need to do this. And it's like, why are you barking out orders before they even told you the situation? Because nine times out of 10, most of these kids got so much stuff going on at home. You couldn't even believe it. (laughs) And it's wild. They deal with so much at a young age. Would you recommend somebody use their friend as a therapist? Or would you say that they should go and go to a licensed therapist? So basically, should <laughs> our significant other, our partner, or our friend be out there, basically? Uh, should this, um, <laughs> this is the question that I, it annoys me, man, because I honestly don't think that your partner, your family member, your friend should be your therapist. Because for one, it's not their responsibility. It's not my responsibility to be your therapist because at the end of the day, you are responsible for your own mental well-being or mental health, just like I'm responsible for mine. And when you get to thinking about it, a therapist is a person that's professionally trained to do what they do. They go through rigorous hours in school to get the training that they get done. You know, they have to do specific type of internships where they have to work with different populations to be able to do what they do. And so when you're looking at a therapist, a therapist is a person that's professionally trained to be able to help an individual using different type of theoretical modalities, using different type of theoretical perspective. Whereas my family member or my girlfriend or my friend, they can't do these things because they haven't been necessarily trained to be able to do these things. I also think about it in terms of this right here. So let's say for instance, I wasn't feeling well and I needed to go to the doctor. 
well, I'm going to go see my doctor, but nine times out of 10, my significant other or my family member or friend is not my doctor. Or let's say I get into some legal issues and I have to go see an attorney. Well, most of the time, my attorney is not going to be my friend most of the time or my significant other or my family member. So if I won't go see these people as my, that are my friend, family, or significant other as a therapist, you know, I'm not going to go see my friend, family, or significant other. And I don't think, I think it does a disservice to your family member or friend or significant other too, because you put that burden on them. The only thing I think a friend or family member or significant other should be responsible for doing or can do is helping you get the help that you need. So let's say, for instance, you don't know how to find a therapist. Well, maybe you and your friend can sit down and research therapists online. Well, let's say, let's say for instance, you're having a bad mental health related episode and you need help trying to get to the hospital or whatever mental health facility you need to go to. Maybe that friend or family member can actually take you to that particular hospital or mental health related facility. But no, it's not their responsibility to be your therapist. Now, of course, you know, when we're in relationships or we have friends and family, we tend to talk about how our day went at work or how my annoying co coworker made me mad again or how my boss got on my nerve. And now I'm thinking about leaving the job. But that's simple stuff. It's not heavy. severe yeah. depression. So, no, yeah, heavy. it should just <laughs> be a no. It should be, I, <laughs> it should be I think that was a great comparison to compare mental health to like your um, physician. <laughs> or to a lawyer, because I think a lot of times people, uh, they they have a misconception about what therapy is. I think they think that you go into somebody's office, lay across their couch and chop it up. And that's just- <laughs> That's TV that, definition. You don't, you don't I, chop it up? You don't chop it up? Listen, no? a good, listen, a good <laughs> therapist, a good therapist, well, I don't wanna say that. Let me not say a good mm, therapist. Mm, you about to shake the room. <laughs> <laughs> My style of therapy is to make it feel like a conversation that is free flowing. So it may feel like we're chopping it up, especially with working with teenagers. I definitely make it feel like we're kicking it basically. Uh -huh. But while doing that, like you said, we have studied different modalities. So within that chopping it up, I know, oh, I'm gonna help oh, them. Whoa, like, whoa, what? whoa, time out. Can, can you define that for, some, for the people that are listening and watching? You said, define what? what was that? Mo you said this, this long word. It yeah, just means um, it just means different <laughs> different techniques, different types of therapy. Um, I don't want to go into detail about the different. Oh no, types. you ain't got to. I just want to break it down because <laughs> you know but, somebody yeah. will probably be listening and be like, "Yeah, it just means different types." Um, so what was I saying? Oh, so yeah, so within that conversation, I am still going to be using certain techniques. So all of that to say, I think that was a great comparison because. If I can't see my doctor, I'm not going to then call my boyfriend or call my mom and say, hey, I have these ailments. What do you think is going on? What would you prescribe for me? Like that, what? <laughs> that doesn't make sense. So I agree with him wholeheartedly. Your people cannot be your therapist. And also, even if, even if you wanted me to be your therapist, Justin, because we're friends, ethic, ethic, yeah, can't speak today, ethically, I couldn't even do that because that is a, um, a dual relationship. So technically I can lose my license for that. Just for any listeners who are going into therapy, social work, anything like that, but yeah. Yeah, but what would you say to the person that says, well, my friend um, is going through, went, already went through what I already went through and they can just tell me from their past experiences and I can just tell them and they gonna, you know, tell me what I need to do. So I need to go talk to a licensed professional for I mean, you oh, got I'm people that talk like that. <laughs> I'm gonna tell them past experiences. One person's past experiences doesn't doesn't um, define another person's past experiences. So just like um, me, you know, I may go through something similar. Jonathan, you may go through something else similar. But at the end of the day, we're not gonna go through those things the same way, both alike, because we're yeah. still two different people. We may we may both be black African American men. We may be both alphas, but your way of growing up and the way you were raised may be totally different than the way I was raised. Okay. You know, you may have grew up in a totally different home than I grew up in. And all of those things play a part when it comes to even receiving services or being able to be benefits of services. Because 
no two minds think alike. So just because we're going through a similar experience don't mean that we're going to think the same way. Then, of course, we can give each other feedback on what happened with me or we can kind of be there for each other because, yeah, we did go through something similar, but I can promise you those two things that we went through are not going to be the same because we're not going to be thinking the same because we both come from different type of backgrounds or upbringings. Also, that goes back to, I don't remember who said it, but that goes back to you start to, if someone comes to you with something heavy and you say, well, I went through this, this is what I did. I promise you that person will continue to come to you every time they're triggered. And then do you have the bandwidth to deal with it? Probably not. <laughs> so you might last a little bit, you know, but eventually it'll get on your nerves. Exactly. <laughs> Cause you will have your own stuff going on. Yeah, exactly. So that's why they, it would be best that they go to someone who is paid to do that. You don't want to lose a good friend over that stuff. Um, because the conversation around mental health is becoming more popular to speak about, especially on social media, especially on Clubhouse, I've noticed. Right. Um, it's becoming this uh, trend, I guess, where people get on to different platforms and they will go into explicit details into the different traumatic experiences that they have had. Facebook. Facebook, Clubhouse, <laughs> Twitter, Instagram. Uh, TikTok, uh, out there, huh? TikTok, especially TikTok. Oh my gosh. Um, do you think at some point it is becoming too much? Like, is there too much trauma dumping that, uh, that we would call it on social media platforms? <laughs> okay. Hey, I'm so glad you brought that Clubhouse. I don't even get on that thing no more, man. I <laughs> so I get on there on one day a week. It's on Monday. But the only way I only reason I get on there now is because I do a study group um to help other people basically pass their licensure exam. I need to slide in there. Hey, <laughs> so on some Mondays, I'm gonna put that shameless plug in there. It's Mondays from 5 p.m. Central, 6 p.m. Eastern. It's called Journey to Licensure, where we have a bunch of folks on there, not just people that people that are preparing for clinical exam, master exam, bachelor exam. They all come in there. We be there every Monday. It's called Journey to Licensure. I'm the co-founder of the group. I do it with my with the founder. Her name is Shara. Uh, but it's a good group. But Clubhouse became too much for me. But you mentioned the word trauma dumping. And so first we need to define what is trauma dumping because some people may not exactly know what it means. So trauma dumping is basically when a person unloads whatever they may have going on with their life. Emotionally, they may unload it on family, mm -hmm. on friends, significant others, or in this case, strangers, because we're talking about social media. And a lot of people yep. we on social media are strangers. But now, do I believe that it's becoming too much? I actually do believe it's becoming too much. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I say it's, it's becoming too much is because for one, the policies and procedures of these different type of mental health related uh, challenges that we may have, these actually, actual um, social media sites, they do not have the proper policies and procedures in place. You know, over the last two years, for sure, with the pandemic, I feel like trauma dumping is becoming a whole lot more mm -hmm. bad because if you get on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Clubhouse, if you read through these policies and procedures that people have on these actual sites, they don't have anything into place that enforces people not doing those things. I mean, let's be honest, you can get on Twitter right now and just you just scroll down your timeline and somebody could possibly have retweeted somebody naked on Twitter or yeah. somebody having sex on Twitter. Like this stuff has become such a norm that you see this stuff every single day that you kind of become immune to it. And so with there not being any type of policies and procedures in place, I can post whatever I want to post on social media. And nobody's going to say anything to me about it. Um, one post can start a whole media storm. And I think okay. about And one thing that I hate to see is when you have individuals that post like themselves crying as a video or picture. That what's, irritates me. <laughs> what's the guy named um, Devon Franklin? So, you know, he was Megan Good's, well, now ex-husband. On New Year, he posted a picture of himself on Instagram. He was crying. And I guess he was giving this New Year resolution. And they I didn't had even just, realize that. Oh my they gosh. Had just broken up. And I think like the word had came out and he was talking about what happened. And 
he, he was talking about a new year resolution. He was like, I normally don't do new year re resolutions because that's so taboo. Mm -hmm. But he posted a picture with himself crying. And I'm so like, man, why are you posting yourself crying on social media? We, we really don't care about you posting yourself crying on social media. Now, I don't think, I think the majority of people don't mean any harm when they're doing things like this, mm -hmm. but they don't realize the trauma dumping that they're doing and the harm that it's causing on other people. And a lot of times I don't think people understand the difference between trauma dumping and venting. It's a difference. Okay. So when you vent to a person, venting is a healthy way of expressing yourself or whatever you may have going on. You may go and vent to somebody. But normally when you go vent to somebody, one thing that we always tend to do, what most people are, like if I, if I was coming to you, Deja, to talk to you, I, could, I would say something like, hey, can I talk to you for a moment? And you may say yes. And so you're giving me permission to talk to you. You know, you're giving me permission to, you basically, for you to be a listening ear for me to talk to you. So that's venting. It's healthy. We do it in a healthy way because we ask for permission to vent most of the time. Whereas trauma dumping, we just basically randomly do it. We don't ask for no permission. We just basically start talking. We expect people to sit there and listen to us. And then a lot of times when they don't listen to us, we get mad about it too. Well, I'm, I'm trying to tell you something. You're not listening to me. Or I'm trying to tell you how I feel about a situation and you're not paying me any mind. But that's not my job to do because first of all, you didn't ask me, was I in a, an appropriate space to be able to listen to you talk about this stuff? And so I feel like a lot of times we get trauma dumping and venting confused. And a lot of times I feel like people just don't have anyone want to go to. Like, let's be honest, everybody don't have a strong support system. So you may not have nobody to go to, or you may not know how to seek those particular services that you may need. Mm -hmm. So you get on these social media sites and talk about this stuff. I said about a couple, about a couple of weeks ago, I was talking about Twitter. Twitter is one of those sites where you can go to Twitter and you can basically talk to yourself on Twitter. Whereas in person, if somebody saw you talking to yourself, they may call you, say you may have a mental health related issue. But on Twitter, I talk to myself all the time. I tweet thoughts about, you know, I tweet thoughts out and don't nobody judge me or nothing like that because that's that's the norm on Twitter. And so I feel like a lot of times people just need to get stuff out. So they just trauma dump it on Twitter or they trauma dump it on Clubhouse or Instagram or they post little Facebook posts, all these different things. But I wish people would think about alternative methods such as possibly getting a journal. You can externalize yeah. how you're feeling and your feelings in a journal by writing the thoughts down that you have or maybe doing yoga, meditation, mindfulness, because I, or joining a support group where people that are maybe going through similar things, you all can connect and correlate. But I don't think we think about these things because for one, like I said before, policies and procedures don't allow us to because they don't enforce anything. And it's easier for me to pick up my phone and for me to go tweet something or it's easier for me to go post a photo on Instagram to get a remark. And a lot of times what you see people will post things because they know people are going to respond to it um, versus actually going and talking to somebody about it. So that is a big issue. Yeah. Justin? Yeah. Yeah. What you say about the response part, I'm going I'm to finish that off for you. <laughs> They'll trauma dump it. And then when somebody gives their two cents about it and it doesn't align with what they just said, all types of stuff is breaking loose on whatever social site that you're on. So not only did you trauma dump about your situation, now somebody is giving their opinion about your situation. Now you upset, you triggered all over again. Now you mad about what just occurred or what happened and you mad about what's going on right now. So nothing's been resolved. All you've done is make yourself more upset than you've already been. Um, one, thing, one thing I didn't consider is the policies and procedures that you brought up. Um, because I, I do think that there is a fine line where I could see uh, how someone sharing their experience could potentially help someone else because it could, it could, trigger, someone. To, it could trigger someone, but it could also help them <laughs> recognize the flags or things going on in their own life or simply that they're not alone in their experience. But I do feel like it needs to be, there needs to be some way to, else to do that. So like the support groups are having a closed group on a Facebook or Instagram, where if you're dealing with a particular thing, all of y'all could go to that group and discuss it and go into details because then people are prepared mentally to read those things and to have those exchanges. Um, now, 
the next comment I'm going to make, <laughs> people may not agree with. Um, I don't think that most people do this, but I do think that there are a special few and especially this newer generation coming up. I feel like there are people in this world who weaponize mental health problems. Oh, they definitely do. Yeah. And, but what I mean by that is, so I, I really see it on Clubhouse a lot. I've seen uh, guys specifically, they might've very well gone through something. I do. They might've gone through something hey. and pretty hard. <laughs> And what they'll do is they'll put it in the title and then that gets people in the room to come listen to them. And then they'll tell the same story 10, 20, 30 times until they get the amount of followers they want. And so then they get, which I like to call clout <laughs> on Instagram. So now they get a YouTube. And so now they have this um, visibility because of an incident or some kind of traumatic experience that they've had, which I think is disgusting. Now, on the flip side of that, I feel like the newer generation, there are special children that they know the right words to say to misuse certain resources that are available for people who are actually struggling, struggling mentally. For example, I might get a kid who is pissed off because they got grounded, and this is a real example, because they got grounded. Oh my God, I'm depressed. Okay, I'm gonna write out a letter. Oh my, call the hospital. Let me go ahead. And so then they do all of these things and you have to follow procedures. And so now this kid is hospitalized. And so now when they go back to school, they have extra time on work. And it, it, I don't know. I just feel like there are certain people because this is becoming more of a conversation and people don't fully grasp certain things. They're scared. So they think if someone's sad, then automatically... Um, they're suicidal and that's not the case I respect all womanhood but there are women that have had traumas and are doing the exact exact same thing oh I'm that sure you said they that are I said I see I just clubhouse want, oh I've seen I've seen not on clubhouse but I've seen women with past <laughs> traumas do that exact same thing I just want to clarify oh, I'm, sure. that be I, I'm not saying just men but do. then I'm saying I that's what I saw specifically on clubhouse um but yeah I know it's not everyone that does oh, that, yeah. but there are special people out okay. in this world that weaponize it. <laughs> um, but following that up, when people do post traumatic things and you don't really know what to say, they're like, well, at least you woke up this morning. Well, at least this is happening. And to me, um, that's not helpful. And to me, I would identify that as toxic positivity. Because, well, I'll let y'all, I'll let y'all go into it before I say what I need to say, but um, do you even think that, do you agree? Do you think toxic positivity is a thing? <laughs> so when you asked me that question and, you know, we was talking, I was looking at the question and everything, I was thinking about it. And I, I thought long and hard about it, but I actually do think it's, it's a thing. But somebody may ask what is toxic po positivity because somebody might not know, because to be honest, it wasn't until uh, recently, not like yesterday, but probably a few months ago that I really started looking to what toxic positivity is. And it's yeah. pretty much what you just said. It's the belief that no matter how difficult a situation may get, no matter how dire it may get, there's still light at the end of the tunnel or everything is still going to be okay. And it's okay to have that stance and believe that, but also it can be dangerous. And the reason why I say it can be dangerous is because, for one, in life, we're going to go through things. We're going to have ups and downs. You know, life is full of up, ups and downs. That's the part of the life cycle. Everything in life is not always going to be perfect, as we all know. And so one thing that I don't think we should ever do is speak on another person's situation and how they feel about something, unless they ask us to. So let's just say, for instance, your dog just got ran over. You had this dog in your family for years. And the dog is, you know, when you had a dog in your family for years, that's pretty much a, a family member. Family member. Yeah. yeah. And so y'all had this dog since you was 10 years old, and now you're 21, and the dog got ran over. And now you're sad, you're distraught, you're very upset about it. And somebody comes to you and say, Man, I'm sorry, little Rocco got killed, but uh, it's gonna be all right, man. That's not what I want to hear in that moment. Because or get another in this, dog. Exactly. <laughs> this particular moment is not going to be all right. Because 
I'm experiencing what I'm feeling right now. And we see this a lot of times, like if you lose a job, or let's say, for instance, you go through a breakup. Those are both tough situations where you may have a friend, a family member comes and say, hey, man, hey, you're going to be better off of this. Or that's their loss. I've heard that so many times. That's their loss. Or you're going to find a better job and stuff like that. And it may be the case or it may not be the case. But one thing yeah. that I think when we experience negative emotions and negative feelings, a lot of times a negative situation is going to breed negative feelings or negative emotions. It's just a part of life. So like I said, if my dog got killed, I'm going to be sad about it. If I lose my job, I'm going to be upset about it. If I run over something with my tire and the tire bust after I had just bought a tire last month, I'm going to be mad about it because situations that we go through, they breathe certain type of results or feelings. A lot of times people don't know what to say. So I have been around friends that, that went through hard times and I didn't know what to tell them. You know, they crying, snotty nose, everything, um, shaking and everything. And you sitting there, they came to you because they trust you to make them feel better. But a lot of times saying stuff like everything happens for a reason is not what they want to hear. So a lot of times you don't have to say anything. Just being there, letting them talk to you, let them vent. You just being a listening ear can go a long way instead of you exhibiting toxic positivity. Justin? Yeah. When I hear toxic positivity, the thing that comes to mind is uh, somebody that's enabling bad behavior from somebody when they're basically expressing to you that their mental state has gotten to a point where they're thinking about doing certain things and you're sitting there agreeing with them instead of shutting it down. I think look at it when I hear toxic positivity, po toxic positivity as enablers, uh, people that, you know, need, should take action or say something when they notice that that person's mental state isn't in the best, isn't in the best interest of themselves. So when you see that they could possibly do something that could harm themselves or someone you need to speak up as an example, Oh, so-and-so broke up with me. I'm going to go over there and slash these tires, bust these windows. I'm going to go crazy. That's like now, this can go vice versa. I mean, look, <laughs> it, hey, anything is possible. Uh, anyway. You ain't speaking from experience. No, 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 no. That's not that's so, I mean, specific. No, nah, I, mean, I mean, you know, vice versa. It could be a man do it, too. I know a lot of people with the insulin, they could be a woman. It could be a man. There are men Why that not? get, you know, get, get wild, you know, get crazy with it. But, you know, it's just one of those things, like, as a friend, or somebody that gets wind of that, you shouldn't encourage that because there's going to be consequences for every action. I think uh, toxic positivity does exist. And I I don't know. I feel like it's just, it lacks empathy. It lacks empathy. Because when, you're, when you are being in that space and saying it is what it is, whatever, um, you're dismissing someone's feelings, which is the exact opposite. <laughs> of empathizing with that person and trying to understand what they're experiencing. Um, which I understand you have those means where you have your friend crying and you looking at them like, I don't know what, I don't want to touch you. I don't know what to say to you. And I think like Jerron said, maybe not saying anything, just being there. Or I know for me, if someone is telling me something that I haven't had firsthand experience with, but as a human being to another human being, I can see that this is painful. I might say something like, that must be really hard for you, right? You're not saying like, ugh, if I was in your, no, that must be really hard for you. You're going, you're going through a breakup, you just lost your job. That can be frustrating. That can be disappointing. That's unfortunate. Simple, to the point, <laughs> you don't have to go on a big, go ahead. <laughs> what would you say to the person that says, am, am I able to say, if you need if you need anything, please let me know. Would that be classified as okay to say? What I'm trying yeah. to well, the question I'm trying to pose is ask you, you guys both. What are some things that you can say that would classify as okay? I know we just listed two, but would those be the only <laughs> yeah. two things that they can say? No, what you just said. If you because okay, so you just said if you need anything, let me know. That is allowing that person to tell you what they need. Right? right, like they're setting that boundary. They're speaking up for themselves. I think that's fine. Or, um, basically uh, anything that's validating someone's feelings yeah. and what they need, that's what you can say. So what I understand, I yeah. To, what what can say? I do for you in this moment? Or yeah. non verbal cues. So I, I may be going through something, patting me on the back, like, or just being there, sitting by my side, 
patting me, you know. No, nah, you pass somebody, console them. Yeah, sometimes you don't even got to say nothing. Exactly. Sometimes you don't even got to say nothing. But what can that's, I do for you in this moment? <laughs> you sitting here by me. What can I do for you in this particular moment? And they may say, well, uh, I just need you to sit here with me. Or I just need you to listen to me. Or can you, hey, can you um, go with me to get ice cream? Something like that. You just never know. But you put the yeah. ball in their court. You never yeah. want to have the ball in your court. When somebody's going through something, put it in their court for them to be able to tell you what they can do or what you can do to make them feel better or help them feel better. Um, how can we, other than having conversations like this, start to destigmatize just mental health in general, but then also doing something about it? And we're talking about in our community, right? African-American community? Yeah, yeah. And I'm glad you used the word, how can we? because it is a collective effort. Some people think it's just a one person effort, but it can't be done with one person. And so the first thing that I think we can, and there's a, there's a lot of things we can do, um, but the first thing I think we should do is we have to be able to educate people, more people about mental health and the impact it can have on you. I feel like we're starting to talk about it a lot more as we see nowadays, mental health is talked about. Whereas when my parents were growing up, especially my grandparents, nobody knew what no mental health was. It wasn't talked about or people was ashamed to talk about it. Now you actually have people that are willing to say, hey, I have a therapist. Like they'll, they'll tweet that or they'll post it on Facebook yeah. or share it on Instagram. Hey, I have a therapist. My therapist helps me. Or my therapist taught me, to, taught me this today. And then 20,000 other people were shared or, or retweeted. And I like to see that because at one point in time, People just thought therapy was for people that the word was crazy. These were crazy. Yeah, had something wrong with them. Exactly. But you don't have to be, uh, have something like that going on to have a therapist. Uh, you know, I think about a therapist, it's just like you go to the dentist for like a checkup or a doctor for a checkup. Like therapist, therapy can be used for that too. You don't have to have anything going on that's an emergent situation where you have to go see a therapist. We also have to do a better job of normalizing mental health out, yeah. letting people know that just because you have a mental health related challenge that doesn't mean that you can't do anything or it doesn't mean that you can't be a person or you can't do the things that actually make you happy isn't the statistic that one in five there are one in five people who have a diagnosable mental health issue isn't that the statistic the last i checked that's so that means a lot of people are going through things we talking about hold up, hold up. we talking about the african-american community we talking so, people as a whole as a whole one well i get to you it's probably hot it's probably yeah. higher in the African American community. Now, something that I've also noticed is, um, I love saying this, is that celebrities are starting to talk about mental health a lot more. Mm -hmm. And at one point in time, they never talked about mental health because you, because like Jonathan said earlier, you know, growing up talking about this stuff or dealing with this stuff, we didn't want to talk about these things because it made us look weak. But now, you know, I turn on TV, and, you know, the LeBron Jameses of the world or the Brandon Marshall. I mean. I don't know if y'all know who Brandon Marsh is, the football player. He, okay. he has a little yeah, podcast. Yeah, I am an athlete. Oh, yeah. Okay, I see you. Talks about mental health all the time. Or, yeah. I mean, the guy had a whole therapy session on television. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, Serena Williams, um, Naomi Osaka, uh, Simone Biles. Those two, I know Simone Biles and Naomi Osaka, they actually stopped performing for a while due to mental health-related issues. And that was on national TV. I think... One, I think Naomi Osaka, she was, it was some tennis, tennis um, tournament or something she didn't perform in. And I know Simone Biles, I think it was the Olympics. Yeah. On the national stage, she didn't perform because she was experiencing mental health stuff. And she stood on that ground too. Of course, there were people that were against it. Oh, why is she sitting out? She going through something mentally. She still should be performing. But she didn't let those individuals make her come back. She stood her ground and came back when she wanted to come back. And I applauded her for that because you got to do what's best for you and your mental health. Yeah. Let's hope we finally get Kanye West to talk about it eventually one day, but that's a different story. He got to get there first. He got to get stable first. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> we're doing a better job, though. We're doing a better job at it. And as long as we continue to make the strides we're making, I feel like we're moving in the right direction. It's not going to be easy, but we've come a long way where we are now from where we were yesterday. Yeah, I think uh, the best way we can go about, you know, 
uh, destigmatizing it is making sure that we all can acknowledge that nobody is perfect. Everybody falls short in some capacity and something that they do. And we just got to let that be known because, you know, a lot of these kids, it starts at a young age. A lot of these issues that adults deal with starts at a young age. A lot of these kids will see a lot of adults and assume that, oh, they got it all figured out. They're just doing fine. They got a car. They got somewhere they sleep at. They don't got to, they do all this, that, and the third. Everything's great. That's not the reality of the situation. A lot is, you know, the sooner kids can actually see the transparency of what actually goes on in life, I feel like the better off they, they can, they'll be because they can, you know, actually see the real and then progress, you know, into adulthood. But I, I know, granted, though, you know, everybody's situation is different. So as far as the, you know, helping with that we just got to talk that's the main thing and people got to listen because it happens so much in the african-american community where you have kids that are willing to talk but nobody to listen it is though because they are creating mental health days in schools that are you can get three or four if i'm not mistaken in certain states where you have mental health days where you can stay home because as a child yeah. if you feel like you're overwhelmed now my question is do you feel as if though that will impede on people's progress as far as working through adversity explain what you mean by that what i mean by that is when you get when it's okay when the when it gets tough right and you're dealing with situations and you be, feel like you're becoming overwhelmed right do you feel as if though giving kids mental health days say for instance three to four days at a young age will make them build the mentality of oh when it gets too hard i need to just take off and take time to myself do you feel that 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 will hinder somebody's progress and growing to be a person oh, that they want to be okay i see what you're saying I see what you're saying i think what you're asking is if kids are allowed to have mental health days are they going to build up uh the ability to use coping skills basically like are they going to be able to deal with issues as they arise or are they going to just be like all right i'll be in my room <laughs> for the day because i'm struggling um i don't know i think that well, I'll say this, this is my hope. My hope is that as we continue to normalize these conversations, um, that we'll move away from people trying to weaponize mental health. So including kids. So if mental health days become a norm, my hope <laughs> is that those kids will have already learned how to have coping skills and coping skills just simply means how are you dealing with a problem, right? So hopefully at that point, they know they can go to their school counselor. They know they can journal, they can listen to music, they can exercise, whatever the thing is so that they don't become accustomed to checking out every time they're struggling. Because if you're constantly checking out because you're struggling, there's a deeper issue because now that's me messing with your overall ability to function in life. And that's when you have something severe going on and you might need to, be on medication or you know something like that so that's my answer to that i agree with you too i believe that um if we are giving them mental health related days what i would like to see is on those mental health related days what are you doing to yeah preserve your mental health and i'm not talking about going to play um madden on your xbox one or your playstation 5 Fortnite, or, all that exactly you can know tiktok and doing a little tiktok dances you know, that's fine. But what are you doing to preserve your mental health? So are you doing any yoga? Show me, show me a video of you doing yoga or show me a video of you doing some mindfulness or show me a video where you show me your journal where you done wrote in your journal today. Like, Hey, today I did this, or I think, I thank God for this day off. This is what I did to preserve my mental health. Cause if we're just giving people days off to mental health days as children, and we don't have anything to show for it because you can give somebody a, a day off and they come back tomorrow and they still acting up or they still have an issue. So on these days that we're giving you off, what are you doing productively to allow us to know that you're taking benefit of these days that we're giving you off? I agree with everything that's been said. Uh, only thing I would add about the conversations is, of course, we want to have conversations celebrity wise locally, but also within your family. Um, one thing I've, and I don't know if it's just a black community thing, but we don't have a lot of conversations about our uh, family history when it comes to health and especially when it comes to mental health. There are certain diagnoses that are hereditary. Like you didn't do anything, you didn't experience anything traumatic. 
it's just within your family system. And so you may have a diagnosis and you may need medication for said diagnosis, but here you are, you don't have any answers because your family has discussed with you, hey, grandma or granny <laughs> had this going on with her. Or the, like, I'll use myself as, as an example. I have dealt with anxiety since I was a kid. Didn't have the word for it, didn't know what it was. I just knew I felt terrible physically when it came to going to school. And I would never feel it in the summertime. Summertime, it was turn up time. But anytime I went to school, I just, my body was out of whack. Fast forward to adulthood, going into this field, going, uh, taking therapy, well, not taking therapy, going to therapy for myself. I started to have conversations with my own family. And then I asked my mom, I was like, no one else deals with this? Is it just me? I, I don't understand. And so she's like, oh, actually, <laughs> um, my granny uh, deals with anxiety issues and takes medication for it. And also I talked to my dad. Guess who else takes anxiety medication? His mother. So I was like, oh, so I was just set up to have this. No one had this conversation with me. And here I am thinking that I'm abnormal at the time. I mean, at this point, I'm past that. But all of that to say, please have conversations with your family about your family history, health-wise and mental health-wise. So that's one. Two, you said something about church earlier in religion. I feel like with anything in life, when you're trying to improve, I'll use getting healthy, for instance, you're not going to just go to the gym and eat trashy. Like you're going to go to the gym, you're going to eat healthy, you're going to drink water, you're going to get sleep. You can have religion as a part of your coping tools, but that can't just be it. If you're trying to be mentally healthier, and it, it can't be. Your pastor is not trained to provide therapy, therapeutic services. Um, and as Hold far as, huh? The pastor, yeah. pastors. Huh? You said the pastor don't do that. The pastor got I your said pastor the pastor is not licensed to provide therapeutic to do, services. Yeah. He can look at that Bible front to back. <laughs> <laughs> but there's nothing in the Old or New Testament that has anything about cognitive behavioral therapy, has nothing about motivational interviewing, has nothing about DBT, mindfulness, none of it. It's the past it all. I, that's fine. <laughs> but uh, uh, <laughs> so the last thing I would say is definitely mental health days, but also some schools are starting to do social emotional learning, which breaking that down just means how can you build healthy relationships and how can you better regulate your emotions when you're upset how can we not steal off on another child how can we breathe <laughs> exit the classroom i think more schools need to have that be implemented and take it seriously because i think that that would help a whole lot with um kids coming up i want to say this right here because I would be remiss if I didn't say it. We've been talking about mental health in a black community. Something that needs to be said is if you do not know how to get help, mm -hmm. um, some sites, some African-American sites that we can actually go to are, you can always go to therapyforblackmen.org. Yeah. There's a to, black girls one too, I believe. Yeah, therapyforblackgirls.com. You got cliniciansofcolor.org. And Taraji P. Henson, she actually has a website um, it was named after her father, and they provide African American services for mental health. And it's called the Boris L. Henson Foundation.org. The Boris L. Henson Foundation.org. Okay. Of course, you can throw out the psychology today and all that, but they don't really cater to us. And so these are some sites that cater to clinicians or Black clinicians or Black African Americans that need help. Another last thing I would say is. When it comes to actually receiving help, don't be so afraid. So if you go to the therapist and the first therapist don't work or the second therapist don't work, don't give up. I always say therapy is like trying on a new pair of shoes. You got to continue to try the shoes on until you get that perfect fit. So for a woman, she may have wore a size before that this size doesn't work no more. So this heel doesn't work anymore. Or for a guy, those jades, may not, you may not can fit them no more. So you got to go up a size in the heel and you got to go up a size in the J's. That's fine. Cause we always don't get the perfect fit on the perfect fit on the right, on the right, on the first attempt. Yeah. So the second attempt may work or the third attempt may work. The most important thing is just not giving up. So just because that first attempt don't work, 
please don't throw in a towel. Keep that goes trying. for the healing process as well, too. Don't expect trauma that you have carried for 20 years to be resolved in one hour sessions. Mm-hmm. Like that, that's a lot. <laughs> Just know that it took time to build that baggage. It's going to take time to unload it and to actually deal with it. So um, thank you, Jerron, for joining us for this conversation. Uh, we really appreciate it. Let us know in the comments, how are you taking care of your mental health? And I will um, put those links to those different websites in the description box below. So join us every Friday. And always remember to like, comment, and subscribe. All right. Appreciate you all.